Okay, I hope nobody says, tell us something funny about the shooting. No, we won't. <laughs> we won't. We won't do anything Bob, tell us something dramatic about the shooting. <laughs> Bob, how about, would you like to start with, could you tell us something that you will take back always that you will remember about Mansfield? We all want to know, what do you think of all of us here in Mansfield, Ohio? Well, we were just talking earlier, Carrie and I, that uh, you all have been so had so much hospitality and generosity and gratitude, and as with uh, most people I run into who recognize me from the movie, uh, they're very much that way toward me, and I, I think it's, we all share such devotion to the Shawshank Redemption and, and what it means to each of us personally, the message of hope and uh, perseverance and friendship and uh, all of those things that I always feel like I'm a little bit of a sort of a priest of this of this particular secular cult of Shawshank Redemption so I'm I, I try and remain uh, aware of that and uh, so if you know my legs start hurting or my hand cramps up I just think, well, this is in a, a good cause. And I, I'm so grateful for this for this movie myself, to be a part of it. You know, I, earlier on, I thought my only possible bid for kind of semi-immortality would be that I once played Juan Perón on Broadway. And now I think uh, I may have scratched into my tombstone. <laughs> this dude was the warden. His ass now belongs to God. <laughs> <laughs> What's this weekend been like for you? Uh, it's been um, oh, delightful, but also kind of a whirlwind because we uh, we are actually headed to Hawaii after this. So uh, we are we flew out, spent a lot of day, a lot of the day in the air, came here, and immediately was plunged into you know, meeting seemed like thousands of people, probably hundreds, and uh, so it's it's been um, pleasantly exhausting. And uh, but we get uh, a week in, in uh, Hawaii to uh, rest and recuperate. But it's been exciting and seeing people that I recognize. And uh, another benefit has been uh, a reunion with my dear friends here from uh, Rochester, New York, who made the great sacrifice of trying driving six hours to be with us. And also, <clears throat> there, there was another gentleman with whom I served in Vietnam, whom I had not seen in since 1970. And the last time he saw me, I was getting on a chopper to go to a fire base that was under siege. So he never even knew for many years that whether or not I'd survived. Of course, I didn't know whether he had either. So we had a very emotional reunion. I was looking up at signing things last night. I look up and I see this face from the dim past. And he brought his whole family. They lived here in, in uh, Ohio about an hour from here. And um, I, I, I wanted to get together with him in the past, but I never had the opportunity. <clears throat> so he showed up, Larry Lord, and, and uh, we we're able to do what all of us Vietnam veterans do, which is welcome each other home. Nice. What, what memory really sticks out to you when you're here at, um, at the prison? What, what goes through your head when you walk back in through these doors? Well, uh, I, I think as much as anything, it was the fun of doing this. Because, you know, I, I've done lots and lots of movies, and some of them have been really stinkers. <laughs> and uh, some of them have just been plain hard work. And others have been successful and, and, and uh, you know, uh, monetarily successful. But this was a totally unique experience because all of us, from the groundskeeper to the teamster to the costumer to the extras, knew they were a part of a great movie. And when you have that kind of bond with other people, you know, the usual annoyances that go on on location <clears throat> and 20 years ago, Mansfield wasn't the bubbling uh, cosmopolitan center it has become. <laughs> it was that it was like being 
you know, quite out there for those of us who lived in New York and L.A. Uh, but I remember how good those times were. And when you're doing something that you really believe in and love, and in my case, I thought this was the best character I'd ever, ever been given to portray. I think he was very uh, rich, in, not just a bad guy, but interesting bad guy. And his being drawn to Andy so strongly and uh, his crisis, of, his own crisis of, the, of a very warped conscience when he has to blow the kid away. <clears throat> and um, him, him being someone who seems so in control for three quarters of the movie and then just loses it and, and the deliciousness for the audience <laughs> of watching this guy Every time he turns his head, there's some new surprise, whether it's his unshined shoes, which aren't his shoes, or the rock hammer in the Bible, and uh, salvation lies within. Each time during that 20 minute sequel, he's coming up against another uh, proof that he was the one who was obtuse. Because yeah. he didn't know what was going on. And uh, that was fun to play. Yeah, sorry. Um, the um, you know you've talked a lot about the impact that the movie has when you've met people throughout mm -hmm. time, um, and you talked about how while you were filming it, you knew it was something special. But when the movie first came out, it had modest success. Mm -hmm. What did that feel like at the time? Uh, I was shocked. I think all of us were shocked. Uh, I mean, it's not the first time that a, an exceptional movie. Uh, does not, you know, break down the doors when it's initially released. And then over time, uh, people begin to appreciate its nuances. And, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't written for critics. It, were, it was written for people for whom hope is a precious commodity. And I think part of the reason that this is has such a spiritual pull to it is that uh, the underlying message of hope in the face of what anyone would say is the worst situation they could think of as Andy is crawling through 500 yards of sewage <laughs> to his emancipation after 20 years um, then you know I, I used to be surprised that women love this movie because it's it's a prison movie. But then I thought, you know, there are a lot of women in what seem like hopeless positions, in bad marriages, in jobs where they can't, they are the superior employee and they hit that glass ceiling. Uh, and, uh, you know, problems with children and just the problems of being a woman in this world. You've got to have hope. And, and also, I think a lot of women understand in a way that men don't always do, the transforming power of friendship. And Andy and Red both save each other. Uh, Andy would not have survived without Red, literally from just supplying the posters to cover the hole in the wall, but also someone who, who got him, who, who initially in the movie, thinks he's walking around with a stick up his butt and gradually begins to see that this is uh, a soul with some light in it. And the same way, Red being resigned to spending the rest of his life in this hole as a good man who did something terrible when he was young. So each of them brings out the best in the other. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the payoff of their triumph together, that simple shot of, of Red running towards Andy, who's scraping his boat to, to bring to life the dream that he shared with his friend. It's, it's, uh, you don't see that a lot. I think people have to mature. I think so too, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a very mature piece, and yet it's accessible. It's not a snobby kind of uh, intellectual exercise at all. It's very visual. It's it's pretty brutal in its depiction of um, 
what prison life is like, and even just being in this place is a reminder of the absolute uh, the hell hole that, that these kind of places can be. And yet there's always hope. Is there something special that you kept from the movie? Do you have anything really special that you were able you to... You mean watch? besides residuals? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we all um, wish we had those, I'm, right? I'm sure, I, as I said earlier, I, I tried to get the suit, which I thought was cool. Yeah. And uh, I, I couldn't have that because oh. they, they were thinking they might have to do reshoots at some point. So uh, um, I think most of what I have are the memories and, and the, uh, the emotional uh, gifts of this. And also, I, I got a, a big boost in my career. I mean, I did bang, 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 five big movies within a year of, uh, after this came, actually after this wrapped, because people heard about it and heard about uh, my performance, and I was hired for movies that I wouldn't have been considered for. And, uh, you know, for a character guy who slips from one character to another, and there's people that come up to me all the time and say, I didn't know you were in that movie. That was you? <laughs> because I do tend to sound and look different. But to have a role in which, in, in a great movie, in which people say, oh, I know that guy. You know, even if they don't know what my name is, they know that guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those are the kind of gifts I have from it. And the friendships that came from it. And the business relationships. And the residuals. <laughs> Well, the, the Do you have a message for the uh, people that have followed the movie all this time? <laughs> um, well, you know, I don't know what to say other than uh, I understand that when you walk in the house and this is playing on TBS and it's halfway through, why you have to grab a beer from the refrigerator, sit down and watch the rest of it. So I just say keep watching it. And maybe someday you won't have to keep watching it. But probably not. Um, the movie has sort of an exponential growth. It seems yes. to just every year it's more popular than the year before. Um, and I, nobody seems to be able to think of another movie that's like that. Um, no. what, what do you think is the, the magic that makes that? I think Ted Turner is a big part of the magic. <laughs> because he bought the studio yeah. that produced this movie. Okay. And it became, this movie became a, a part of his film library. Mm -hmm. At the time, he owned TNT, TBS, and TCM. Mm -hmm. And in rotation, he played this movie over and over and over on the cable stations. Okay. And there was something hypnotic about it. And, you know, people started watching it. And then they started looking for where they could right. see it. So I think that business decision on his part disseminated it in a way uh, that got people talking about it. Uh, mm -hmm. You see, uh, the, the ship shank, I mean, they couldn't even say the word sometimes. Yeah. And this happened all over the world. And because of, right. of uh, global television sure. now, people in countries that might not have access to theaters do have access to cable stations. Sure and uh, particularly the uh, uh, antenna-based, whatever it's called. Um, satellite. Satellite, yeah. yeah, satellite TV. So I think technology yeah. uh, came along at a time that allowed this movie to have a bigger, even more uh, powerful life other than on the movie mm -hmm. screen. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's interesting. The most, uh, the biggest news story that day was the day that the tree was hit by lightning. Right. In the in the and world, it was the biggest news about. story in the world yeah. that day, <laughs> and people mourned a tree. I think more than anything, it's it's the everybody recognizes something very human about the movie, yeah. even if it's in French or German mm -hmm. or whatever language. They, they see it in, and uh, I've been all over the world, several continents, and the reaction of people, even those I can't understand, <laughs> are the same thing. Yeah. This is, oh my God, I, whenever I see it, I have to watch
watch it again and again and again. And everybody says that. Okay, Bob, I'm getting the high sign from Jody that it's time to...